Hello there. This is a program sponsored by the Free Thought Forum, or of the Free Thought Forum. Uh, it's sponsored by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. And I'm Joe Barnhart, and welcome. And I'm Suzanne Molnar. We want you to know that if you do or don't believe in God, you are not alone. Right here in East Tennessee, you can find free thinking atheists, uh -huh. agnostics. Uh -huh. This is a show for them and for people committed to a life rooted in science and free of supernatural beliefs. And the topic today is a psychologist's take on religion. And I'm very eager to see what Dr. Suzanne Molner is going to tell us. We'll have, I'm sure, questions calling in and good discussion. But first, we want to tell you a little about the sponsors of our show. The Atheist Society of Knoxville frequently has a fun meetup here at a bar or an eatery. Uh -huh. Tonight's meetup is at Barley's in the Old City, starting around 5.30. Uh, that's right in the middle of our show. We don't want them to leave, do we? <laughs> well, they may be there listening. Maybe, okay. They got the TV there. It is St. Patrick's Day, after all, even if we didn't remember to wear green. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Look for the silver-jacketed copy of The God Delusion standing upright on the table. Everyone is welcome then, huh? Everyone's welcome at our happy hour for food, drink, and conversation. But if you plan to preach, <laughs> proselytize, provoke, or, or punch, <laughs> please don't come. Okay. And the way for the rationalists of East Tennessee and have several regular meetings, first and third Sunday mornings of the month are usually roundtable discussion. And that's in the Goins building at Pellissippi State College, usually about 1030 in the morning. Then the, on some Sundays, second Sunday, we have the Skeptics Book Club. And that's uh, on the fourth Sunday. Uh, it alternates with the Reflections Group meeting. And uh, we, you can look that up on, what do you call it? The website? Yeah, and that sort yeah. of thing. Okay. Later in the show, we'll give you our websites to visit for additional details, including times and locations. Okay, now we, we don't have much news. An uh, 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 interesting thing is uh, in the Baptist uh, today, which is a, not the fundamentalist Baptist, but the modern, they're so talking. So you say. Yeah, well, no, this is fact. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, they're talking about the rabbi's comments on birth control, and it's mm -hmm. kind of interesting. Uh, we, uh, we probably should have a whole program on that, but it, because the yeah. Pope is, I think, getting aware that it's wrong, and he makes it clear for a woman to just keep having children when they cannot afford this. He thinks this is irresponsible. Now, he's locked into the position. You can't have birth control except using, you know, the, the, the traditional method, yeah. which the, in other words, you can't use a non-natural. Now, I, I think we Vatican could- Vatican Roulette, I think is what that's yeah, called. Yeah, yeah. And the whole notion of natural, I think, is just, it breaks down. Uh, here's a pope sometimes wearing uh, glasses and driving a car. All this is unnatural. Shoes. <laughs> so what, what do they mean by natural? And, and, and spell it out very clearly. And I have not seen a good, clear definition of this. Well, anyhow, let's get back to our topic. Our uh, guest today is, uh, is half retired. Psychology, psychologist, uh, staff member at the University of Tennessee, and that's in clinical practice also, supervising and training the doctoral students at the Student Counseling Center. Right. That's a job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the good part, the doctoral students. Uh, oh, Definitely. yeah, that is right. The, the freshmen you know. the more difficult. Yeah, that's true. And. Uh, so we're going to talk about religion and uh, a psychologist viewpoint. Uh, and let's just plumb, how, how do we handle religion psychologically? Well, personal disclaimer, I think I'll start with where I am and then because mm -hmm. I'm a psychologist. 
I'm not speaking for the American Psychological Association or anything. Okay. Um, and I first figured I, I ought to look up and find out exactly what religion is, because as I thought about it, people use it to mean such different things. Mm -hmm. So I went to Webster's unabridged. A set of beliefs mm -hmm. concerning the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe, especially as a creation of supernatural agencies, okay. usually involving ritual and often mm -hmm. moral codes, and or a specific set of beliefs and practices agreed upon by a number of people. Mm -hmm. And there's several points in there that I think are really important that I'll get to later. Um, it's founded in very different aspect of people than mm -hmm. rationality is. You know, we're talking emotion mm -hmm, mm -hmm. versus intellect. Not that there isn't some slop over there, yeah, sure. but they're really, in, they're really different mm -hmm. realms. And so in a sense, you know, why, do they, why do they need to fight each other? Mm -hmm. uh, I think they fight each other because they threaten each other. Mm -hmm. um, I know I can feel threatened by in East Tennessee feeling like especially when my kids were in high school it seemed like people uh, just assumed they were Christian and if they weren't what's wrong you don't look Jewish was seemed to be the bottom line uh, uh, whatever that meant <laughs> yeah and and I understand that very religious people often feel threatened you know maybe my kids will go to college and they won't believe in my religion anymore and that uh, feels threatening to them but yeah. anyway um, I am entirely down on the side of a rationalist I trust science rather uh -huh. than myth or tradition uh -huh. and in terms of the supernatural I love what the late Carl Sagan uh -huh. said that the universe is so incredible uh -huh. why do you need anything else why right. do you well, need anything supernatural, supernatural? Yeah. so that's where I am well let me ask you this now you're a counselor and uh, I know enough about you to ask this question. Let's suppose you've got a Christian uh, coming to you. Mm -hmm. Most of my clients are. Yeah, and they, and they need help. Mm -hmm. And they bring up religious topics now and then. And if you have a different point of view from there, I mean, you come at it differently. How do you deal with that? Uh, That's a great question. Um, people do worry about that going to or some people worry about that going to see a psychologist. They're worried about getting somebody who doesn't share their particular beliefs. Uh -huh. uh, I've, I think as I've spent my 35 years, uh -huh. I've had, I've developed more and more sense of what religion is to different people uh -huh. and more of a, and doing that I have more of a sense of what's valuable to a person uh -huh. and what I'm looking for with a client is in the kind of um, what, is sense how you're, of, what you know, the, how's that working for you, fella? Uh -huh. is, uh -huh. is it good? So if is religion, it not good? So in other words, if people come to you, usually because they've got some kind of problem or issue, to, yeah. and so you're saying, well, if you're using religion to deal with this, is it working? Mm -hmm. That's that's pretty much what you're. And how are your how do your beliefs work for you? Um, uh -huh. Do they are they making you miserable? Mm -hmm. Are they scaring you? Or are they Which are is, they helping you in some ways? Are they supporting you in some ways? Would you say in most cases belief is some expectations? I expect this to be, I believe this is, I expect this to behave in a certain way or react to me in a certain way or I to it. And if those expectations don't come off, then that's a challenge to the belief, would you say? I, I think so. And sometimes, yeah, I, I, there's a, okay, I just skipped. There's a great example of that. Mm -hmm. um, one of our local I don't know what you call him, icon, I guess. Uh -huh. uh, Dr. Bill Bass, uh -huh. the man who developed the Forensic Anthropology Center, you know, the uh, uh -huh. Death Saker, the, the body farm. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, his autobiography, he, his father committed suicide when he was a very small boy. Uh -huh. And he said that he 
looking back, he realized he needed the sense that was a benevolent um, parent figure that could take care of him and him. take care of everything. Mm -hmm. um, much later in life, he lost two wives uh -huh. to cancer in very grim ways. Yeah. And he said, by the, the second one, uh -huh. said, there is no benevolent parent figure running this. They wouldn't uh -huh. let this happen. Uh -huh. And has gone to where I'd say is atheism. You know, people die just like animals die, and uh -huh. that's it. Yeah, that and usually in theology, that's called a problem of theodicy or the problem of suffering and evil. If, mm -hmm. if God is omnipotent, all knowing, and omniscient, and omnipotent, all powerful, and um, and good. Yes. Then, how do you explain some of this suffering and mm -hmm. and evil in the world? And mm -hmm. the, the the theory of original sin, which is to shift all the blame over to the human mm -hmm. species, mm -hmm. uh, might account for some evil in the world, <laughs> but not all of it. Yeah. And I don't think it accounts for all animal suffering yeah. in the world. Yeah. And that's one of the things that really strikes me in thinking about religion is how much. Uh, it's founded on setting people apart from the mm -hmm. rest of the natural world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, oh, yeah. Saying we're not the same as animals. And the rules are different for us. And. So is this. Is let this... me go, you know, well, is really God really concerned about the fall of the sparrow? Well, it, yeah. They fall, they fall a lot. <laughs> yeah. And if. And I'm then, do I die the same way the sparrow dies? I mean, just dead, yeah, decomposed, yeah. that's it. Well, it, in, in many religions, in, in fact, all religions who have a God who is omniscient, omnipotent, and good, mm -hmm. have the problem of suffering and evil. Theodicy is a major, major problem. Mm -hmm. And there's one the, theist, E.S. Brightman, who says that God is limited in power. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned this on the program. But he has the, what he calls the non-rational given. So much energy, he can't control all of it. He's good on this ground, or she's good. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but not all of it can be completely controlled. And that mm -hmm. accounts for many of the evils. You no, know, that's, that's the compromise a former minister of ours came up with. Oh, is that Tom right? Rhodes. Yes. Is, is that right? Which I thought was, I thought that was just the most irrational thing I'd ever heard of. You know, <laughs> how do you say you have a, have a God who runs everything and go, but... Well, no. he started to say he runs no. it imperfectly. <laughs> it's like my car. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't worship your car. I'm not going to worship your car, Joe. I'm sorry. <laughs> By the way, the worship, I think the word, better say, comes from worth-ship. Mm. So uh, they, they use worth. that word in, in England to refer to some people in high, you know, your worship. Oh, your worship, yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, uh, but I'm, I'm with you, uh, passing that off to human beings or God's uh, I can do without. Yeah. So, yeah. but anyhow, in, in dealing with people who have different religions and they're married to each other, how do you deal with that? Well, how do you do marriage counseling, period? Period. Uh -huh. you know? uh -huh. um, it's been said that every marriage is a cross cultural marriage. Uh -huh. uh, some of them just more visibly so than others because it, People come in with their own, each uh -huh. person has their own sets of beliefs, their own uh -huh. expectations, mostly uh -huh. unconscious assumptions about what marriage is, mm -hmm. what the relationship's going to be. And generally, it's been observed, they don't really know the other person very well anyway, so mostly uh -huh. they're uh -huh. created a, a kind of projection of who they're marrying. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so, but to get back to saying religion. Uh, you can talk. You talk about it as okay. This is this is a set of places you really disagree. How are you going to deal with that? Uh, you know, how, are you going to come up with some kind of compromise? Are you going to say, well, and I've known people that did this. I go here. I go here, and that's cool. That's uh, fine. They t it tends to really get sticky when people have children. Oh, when yeah, they have yeah. children, they're a lot better uh, yeah. at maintaining, what do you, what do you teach the kid? Um, 
autonomy. Uh-huh. And you have to figure, oh, what do we do? What about the kids? And that's where people often who have got along very well get that, along that, that, very yeah, badly. Because then you've got to say, whose values are we going to give yeah. to the children? And that's a, yeah. that's a, that's a crucial question. It is, uh, uh, and, and it can make people much more rigid. I have, remember uh, decades ago having a friend who, she was Catholic, but she's a very laid-back Catholic. She used artificial birth control, you know, didn't go to, uh, didn't go to mass much, married a guy who was Protestant, but uh, you know, they get married. She gets pregnant because she stops using good uh, birth control. He starts listening to Oral Roberts. I'll be. I, I mean, it was... <sighs> oh, that, that is a... <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I wasn't there, marriage counselor, because that, yeah. that was just an example yeah, that of... That is very difficult to deal people, with. That. People losing their flexibility when they got uh, together uh, exactly uh, when you uh, needed uh. the most. Uh, well, I remember when, when uh, Mary and I got married. For one thing, we, we uh, had uh, courted for four years. The notion of rushing into marriage, even as a teenager, I knew better than that. <laughs> <laughs> you knew better than a lot of people. And then I went. I was after college. Of course, I had to go to seminary, and Marianne graduated a year ahead of I, of me. And uh, we made an agreement that I would try to bring home to her what I'm learning at the theology school, so that we could grow and develop mm-hmm. together, mm-hmm. rather than our growing apart because we grew up pretty conservative Baptists. Okay. And was she still there when you went? Well, she's still pretty conservative. Baptist and I was, when too, when to... I went to seminary. But in the seminary, you get a whole new world, biblical criticism mm. and, uh, you know, uh, evolution. I mean, the, the whole world is different in, this, in a good Depending seminary. on the seminary you go to, I guess. Yeah, well, yeah, yours, that's, yours did. Huh? Yeah, it was called Southern Baptist, <laughs> but it was incredibly open. Mm. And that later on, it broke up. About 15 of the professors left because the fundamentalists took over. Mm -hmm. But I had the good fortune of having good biblical uh, criticism, Hebrew and Greek, and, you know, really get down to that. Mm -hmm. And so Marianne and I agreed that we would go through this together. Mm -hmm. And uh, that then meant that we didn't reach one one of us on one island and (laughs) and another on another island, you know, 20 years later. Yeah. How did that work for you? Well, it's been 61 years so far, and so far it's been and pretty good And you still look at each other and smile. This is good. <laughs> well, I think I've turned out lucky. <laughs> We've got a phone call, so let's see what we got. Go ahead. Give us your name and give us... Go ahead. This is Charles from Central Illinois. Okay, Charles, go ahead. For a psychologist, given the widespread... Uh, apparently species widespread religious phenomena the belief in, uh, of religious beliefs could there have been a psychologically speaking a uh, evolutionary advantage to uh, having a religious beliefs that is a great question I love it uh, I, I, absolutely, I love that because it it not only says what where might this have come from, but even connecting with evolutionarily speaking, uh-huh, uh-huh. which I'm not an authority on. Um, but it's but, a good, it's a, it is a good question. But yeah, it it meets a lot of human needs. Um, and, and he's talking to evolutionary whenever the species early uh-huh. had a very rough time just surviving, yes. period. <laughs> and one thing one piece of religion is tends to be communal uh-huh. experience, shared experience. Um, yes, we're a social species. And, that, and I think that uh, the phenomena we call religion would be a very strong in-group socializing mechanism. Yes. Yes, I think you're right. And that's that. It's such a good point because the species could not have made it without this socialized aspect. Yes. Yeah, which. You which, can't you can't hunt just one one hunter. Right. I mean, you can't take down a big animal. And children are born so immature yeah. that um, 
they have to be cared for for so many years right. you need the community for that too and so anything that strengthens the community a, it, yeah. is going to have an evolutionary advantage would you say that in some ways that every child has two wombs the, the mother's womb and then the social womb and mm -hmm. and there's where fathers are part of that womb and uncles and aunts and cousins yeah and Definitely. I think to get to our, our callers from Illinois point of view is that it, it uh, did, did religion help in the survival and you're saying mm -hmm. by being a group with a bond and that's by the way one definition one of one of the hundreds um, among the hundreds of definitions of religion well it, it is one of bonding. according to Webster it uh, is it is a piece of it it's yeah. bonding Webster is just well, go ahead yeah what, what I'm thinking of more like is that it, it evolved out of the fact that we are uh, evolved as a social species and as our full brains got bigger because we started mm -hmm. eating more meat or whatever mm -hmm. religion became a byproduct of our social nature a byproduct of our social nature and I think you have another mm -hmm. you're touching on another piece which is the development of the brains we don't know what other intelligent species make of the world and in particular make of death but we are in any even reasonably intelligent human has lots of curiosity about the world and the brighter you get the more questions you have you also at some point realize that people die uh -huh. and we don't know what dolphins make of that or, or chimpanzees do but you know we mostly don't like that very much uh -huh. and that's we don't like having people we love die and unless we're pretty miserable ourselves we mostly don't uh -huh. like the idea of dying ourselves and so dealing with that is um it's been called existential anxiety i guess but yeah, dealing yeah. dealing with that is is a major problem and re religion is one of the ways that you know often it comes up with stories about how ah uh, you're not really going to die not really you're going to survive after so that gives them comfort for a while mm -hmm. it's a, yeah definitely a, a and comfort when you lose somebody and comfort when you realize you're dying it, it, it takes some I, I i was once asked to to write an article in in in, in a german magazine on what is religion or you know basically and i, and I tried to include uh, buddhism which uh, uh theravada buddhism is a non-deity theism mm -hmm. concept oh, well that, that's theravada buddhism and hinayana differ on this yeah but one of them has no deity you know that mm -hmm. that's a hinayana yeah and and i was trying to you can get, argue whether that's a religion or not well i was trying to give a religion a, a definition of religion that would cover both theistic and non-theistic mm -hmm. and i contended that it's a way that people deal their f with their finitude mm -hmm. and uh, and mm -hmm. our, our vulnerability on three levels the physical the emotional mm -hmm. and the intellectual yeah all three of those levels it's very easy to see how limited we are yes very easy <laughs> yes and because we are bright enough to understand that and not like it then we try to come up with something to, make some it better. Way to, to deal with our finitude yeah. we're going to die or we don't know how to solve this problem morally we're in a dilemma or emotionally or emotionally yes you know, uh, uh, and the saint vincent malay i'm not resigned to the shutting away of loving hearts in the cold ground da, 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 yeah. da. you know i know i understand but i do not approve and i am not resigned that's yeah. you know that's people exactly and we can't all go through pretending to be cowboys with no emotion except anger <laughs> look at look not at the Clint Eastwood. <laughs> really uh, I, I always get laughing at the cowboy pictures sometimes uh -huh. is that they try to be unemotional except emotion of anger is the big emotion mm -hmm. <laughs> and i call that I'll, I'll hang up and let somebody else fall in okay mm -hmm. thank you very much thank you. enjoyed it bye bye, -bye. well the caller had a, a good point is that uh, maybe religion did serve mm -hmm. uh, until we could develop other points of view 
uh, the hum I, I could argue a good case. In fact, uh, Stuart Guthrie in the book Faces in the Clouds has argued that we start off uh, pretty much projecting human emotion onto the universe, including other animals mm -hmm. that make animals like us. We see faces in the clouds and we we invent a universe very much like ourselves. Yes. So that we can, and then gradually we learn differently. Mm -hmm. And that probably took centuries. Oh, at least millennia. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think yes. you're right. I, I really yeah. do. We're still learning it. We're still learning. There's, there's still, and there always has been some line at which we don't know. Uh -huh. And then what do you do with that? Some of us say, well, that's kind of cool that we don't know that. And others are, uh, I don't like that. The idea of unknown uh -huh. being scary uh -huh. and wanting to maybe make up a story about what it is. Yeah. And then that story gets enshrined in myth, and it becomes a word of the of authorities. And, and what's even you know. ironic is sometimes the invented. I I, I just re started rereading some passages from my first book called *The Billy Graham Religion*. You said your first book. That's the first book I wrote called *The Billy Graham Religion*. It was translated into German and was published in England in this country. Mm -hmm. And I was giving a pretty severe critique of Billy Graham's view of hell. Mm -hmm. And and it occurred to me, I don't know what, how, how old I was when I wrote that book several <laughs> decades ago, that Billy Graham produces more agony and pain <laughs> with that one doctrine than the, than the primis, primitive species had to start with. Mm. And so I went to a, a kind of a psychoanalysis of a deity, that uh, of what Billy Graham called deity. Yes. And and came up with the view that th this was a a vision of a god who was a megalomaniac, mm -hmm. and he was preoccupied with the human species so much that he couldn't just annihilate them; <laughs> he had to torment them. And uh, now we've got another think, caller. Let's see. Okay. Go ahead, caller. Uh, sorry. We had we had a caller. Go ahead. Uh, yes, this is Chuck. Go louder. There was a California psychologist named Winnell. I think her first name is Melanie. I'm not sure. Uh huh. As she has for years, been trying to get psychologists and psychiatrists to recognize what she calls a religious trauma syndrome. Uh, in which uh, uh -huh. she says for people who leave the church, uh, it's a lot like post-traumatic stress disorder uh -huh. that our troops suffer. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Dr. Winnell uh, was a daughter of two Pentecostal missionaries to Taiwan, and she grew up there. She jokes now that she can uh, even speak in tongues in Chinese. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So she has a very personal, emotional connection with this topic. But she, oh, yes. And she wrote a book called Leaving the Fold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she has oh, websites. Yeah. She has a consulting service. I have a little problem understanding why the Psychological Association of Psychiatrists are so reluctant to do something about this, except this kind of thing, because when I look at the Internet and ask uh, what psychiatrists think of religion, uh, they don't say it very loud, but they say it's a delusion. Mm -hmm. That's what I get off the internet. Yeah, that's that's right out of Freud. Yes, uh, it is oh, right out no. of Freud, and there are. But of course, that's not all psychologists are all psychiatrists. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There's not. Uh, okay. Which is probably why the American Psychological Association and the American Psychiatric Association uh -huh. is being squirrely about this. Um, well, I guess the American Psychological Association may still be squirrely about quite a few things. A few years back, uh, a large group of psychologists left the American Psychological Association to form the American Psychological Society, which is dedicated to scientific psychology. Uh -huh, uh -huh. The name now, it's uh, something uh, yes. like the Association for Scientific Psychology or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it's a large group, and there was a very bad time 
uh, when and still is to some respects, where there are a lot of cracks involved in psychology and popular psychology, and some of that lives on. Sure. Uh, so, and the article I just read in the internet so psychology has a history of this kind of thing. It's always been a lot of internal strife in it. But uh, the American Psychological Association is ready to accept uh, some quack psychologist theories of, of how to make people well uh, and not do anything about it. Okay. Well, thank you for calling in. That, that was good. Uh, well, all groups, when they get together, sometimes and have great value differences uh, start calling their opponents quacks yes uh, or heretics i mean this is nothing yes. new yes. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty it ancient isn't. it isn't and uh, or we even use uh, other uh, words like jerks and i mean you can go it, on and on well, and it kind of gets into the whole business about religion people wanting people to believe what they believe it doesn't mm -hmm. just it's not well, just well, religiously, all, but all, they want... But all, all groups are this way. Yeah. It has to be. For you've got to have a group of scientists. They have certain standards and certain rules and regulations. If you want to play the game, if you want mm -hmm. to be in this, you have to go for this. Now, to be sure, you have to have room for open debate and discussion. Otherwise, it's not a science. But you still have to have rules and regulations, whether you're in scientists, even the assemblies of God. I remember telling a preacher friend of mine, uh, I said, look, I'd like to record you speaking in tongues, and then I'd like to record two Pentecostals separately to give, because there, there's the view you can speak in tongues, then you have the divine interpreters. And I said, I wanted to get one interpreter recorded uh -huh. and then another. They wouldn't let me do that. Yeah. And I said, I know why. Yes. Because you, you were predicting already they're not going to come up with the same interpretation. Yes. And I said, I once got on two shoes, and one of them, as I left, felt very bad and painful. And then it occurred to me somewhere along the way, one of my shoes was the left foot. <laughs> what? I had two pair of shoes that looked alike, and one of them, I got the left foot, and I said, some of our views are like you got a left shoe on the right foot, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you feel the, the, the emotional and the cognitive pain, and you need to change shoes sometimes. Yeah. We've got another call coming in. Go, we've got another call. Well, hello, this is Faithless Forest. I've been watching the show and listening. Good, go. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask your guest, um, I guess it's Susan is her name. Suzanne, if, yeah. Uh -huh. if Suzanne, um, if she might share with uh, the audience and me um, uh, a, a discussion of confirmational bias. I can't help but think that religion lives on because of confirmational bias. Sounds um, like you, you pretty much know what confirmational bias is, that is. Give us an idea what you're talking about. Go, yeah. go. Uh, well, it's a tendency to notice only those facts that support your opinion and uh -huh. not those that contradict it. Yes. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, I assume that there is a psychological explanation for that, that that which which upsets our worldview makes us uncomfortable. But I'm mm -hmm. speculating, and I was hoping mm -hmm. I might get your guest there to talk on this. Are you comfortable speaking on this, Suzanne? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, that is something that oh, I think confirmational bias is, is well established in all sorts of ways. Uh -huh. it's, it's a kind of, it's a source of a lot of errors of, of, in judgment in everything from uh -huh. politics to medicine, you know, um, and in religion. One of the places that I've been, it's hit me hardest, most disturbed me, is when uh -huh. somebody's child is deathly ill, uh -huh. recovers, and someone says to the parent, that was God working. What do you say if the child dies? Uh -huh. You know, the the that would presumably be in God working too. That's the odyssey question again. Yeah, yeah. well, and it's the confirmational bias if you know my belief is that god's god's good so i see this 
I see these good things. If the child dies, I don't even bring God into it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I just pay attention to the pieces that support God being good. Or, of course, there's the other side too. And one of the one of the things I deal with as a therapist is people whose biases in the direction of God is critical. God does not really much trust you or like you, mm -hmm. and... In other words, a punishing God. A punishing um, God had a really, really close friend I dealt with, was a long time with this, where I was trying to nudge him away from the religion he grew up with because he walked around so anxious, so convinced that practically everything, mm -hmm. it was the religion he grew up in, which was very, it was out of the old Norwegian pietism. Oh, yeah. Um, but also, it was the tiny subculture of in Minnesota, and also it was his parents. Both of them were physically abusive. Uh, he was scared of his father. He was scared of his grandfather. His mother was very critical. Uh, he was taught that their judgments are what God would think and also what the whole community would think. And so if he ever got a criticism for anything, it was like, oh, my gosh, this is right. This is, you know. I, I am a bad person. Now, if he was from Norway, was that Lutheran? Yeah. Well, now he it was, well, it was Lutheran, but it wasn't any Lutheranism I'd ever well, heard of. What before. I'm saying is, it it, was a yeah, you're right. Little splinter there, thing. there is in the history of Lutheranism, there is all kind of equipment for dealing with these kind of parents. In fact, uh, if he had known his own religion quite yeah, well, well, these were not Lutheran. Luther, these were not. They didn't yeah. go with Martin Luther. They but went I'm, more with John Calvin. But even Calvin has a notion that parents are not gods, and to think so is idolatry, and that's a sin. He, well, they wouldn't have said they were gods. He wouldn't have said they were gods. But they be, if you, know, you behave of, like that. But one of the uh -huh, one go. of the really early observations from way back before psychology, but certainly psychologists have always seen, is that people create their image of God in the image of their parents. You have kindly uh -huh. parents, you have a kindly God. You have critical parents, you have a critical God. You have randomly punishing parents, you have a randomly punishing God. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so yeah, it's not of... because you think that God is your parent, it's just that that's it's an what's in your head yeah. about what an authority is, what, some, what the world expects of you, uh -huh. you know, from the time when you were so tiny that your parents yeah. were essentially God. Uh, well, it, it, usually people, if they grow up, they tend to, m most people modify their views. They don't say, well, at the age of 14, I'm going to throw out everything I mm -hmm. have learned, unless you're a fool. <laughs> but you well, don't. I think, Joe, you're leading it back to the issue I raised, which is confirmational bias. That tends to anchor your views. Mm -hmm. and. And to modify your views, you've got to be able to accept evidence that doesn't confirm your existing worldview. Is there a way to help people, you know, enlarge their scope? And let me hang up while you try and answer that. Yeah. Okay, so Is there a good. way to help people enlarge their scope? Mm -hmm. In fact, that's partly a part of your job, I would think, it in, is. in some ways. It yeah. really is. And that has to do with religious questions, but also others, of course. But mm -hmm. as far as religion goes, um, and I run into this practicing in East Tennessee, people whose, uh, maybe the quintessential case is a gay male or female. Uh -huh. um, growing up in a religion that first of all, they say that our version of Christianity is Christianity. Uh -huh. And so the kid comes in believing that Christianity says uh -huh. you can't be Christian and be gay, uh -huh. whereas it's really that particular sect of Christianity that says you can't. Uh, but kind of helping them to realize there's more that there's there's more options out there, and I'll try to kind of nudge. Well, okay, where's this coming from? Do you know there are other churches with different views? Uh -huh. And so you did. You nudge them out, not to not to turn them away, make them non-Christian, because mostly they don't want that. But will they consider? So you don't consider your job to be 
converting people to your view of religion. No. No. Yeah, now that's important to point no. out. It, oh, it, you, not are, at all. you are not a hustler in that respect. <laughs> your I'm not, job, you I'm do. not that self confident or that arrogant, you know? <laughs> well, that's, that would be arrogant. It is. Yeah, yeah. you know, if people come to you for help, and you say, well, that's, I think what, if I understand, if talking with you sometimes, as you say, here's a specific problem you're dealing with, mm -hmm. and then have you, have you considered this approach, this mm -hmm. approach, or what's, you would say, well, what's causing you the most problem? Let them yes. figure it out. Yeah, yeah. What's, what's working? What's not working? You, some people can tolerate. Well, my parents think this, but I don't think this, uh -huh. and that's okay. I just don't have that discussion with them, and they go along, and they're really pretty much okay with it. I, re I remember uh, asking my father once. I said, "Did you agree with everything your dad said?" He said, of course not. <laughs> and then he realized. <laughs> you got him. I got it. <laughs> he said, just get out of here. <laughs> Sounds like you had a good relationship with your father. I did. I, you I, were not I, set up for, no, uh, no, for I, Billy Graham's God. <laughs> he was tough, tough, tough. But he was also very tender hearted. And, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, here's an old tough Texan that. Uh, it was just tender-hearted, you know, but you, it was strict, fun-loving, and tender-hearted. And I thought, well, looking back, that's not a bad combination. <laughs> but I remember saying that to him, and he just said, just get out of here. Like, you know, <laughs> you solved it. Don't bother me. <laughs> you caught me on that one. I don't want to look at you for the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I remember as a kid realizing that there are many things in a religion and some parts in a religion don't necessarily fit with other parts in it. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. still have to choose oh. which parts. That's pretty sophisticated for a kid, Joe. Well, it's just ordinary thinking. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, I don't know. <laughs> but I remember, uh, I, I've mentioned this on this program, it really bothered me that the Lord God of the universe would drown all those kids in, in Noah's Ark, from uh, not inside Noah's Ark. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never could square that, mm -hmm. even when I grew up a fundamentalist Christian. In fact, I remember my Aunt Louise, who I, who associated with fundamentalist Christians, and she was taken to be a fundamentalist, but a preacher was talking to me about original sin, and, my, and, and she just interrupted and said, Joe's a good boy. Let's go. <laughs> and that was the end of original sin. <laughs> and, and it dawned on me later that she had another perspective from this from this lone ranger preacher. Yeah, yeah. She had a much more benevolent view of the universe. And than she he just did. shot a hole in him. <laughs> he didn't know it. Uh huh. But uh, so I'm saying that all of us grow up with views. And we discover parts of it don't work with the rest of it. And whether you're an atheist yeah. or a Buddhist or what, that's a fact. Uh, because nobody yep. grows up infallible. Yep. And we may think we are, but... Uh, or we may think our parent is, and then we yeah. figure out, wait a minute, that, that doesn't square, that doesn't either. Oh, oh. Yeah, most okay. kids figure out I think most kids figure out their parents are not infallible. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then, uh, and then it's a question of do you so do you believe now that there's something out there larger that is? Yeah. Because you want to believe something is fallible, or do you go? Okay. I, I remember trying to tell my granddaughter once. I said, "I'm not the boss. The real boss is reality." Oh, that's a good line. <laughs> Oh, I wish I'd had that when I was raising my kids. <laughs> I had one who would look at me and go, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> I'd love to have had that line. Well, I had to right, work at it a long time before I could drive <laughs> Well, that was your grandchild. That was a grandchild, okay, yeah. Okay, I'll remember it if I ever get grandchildren. <laughs> that's, that's good. Okay, well, how then do you handle religious issues with therapy clients. You know, you've, mm -hmm. you've been talking about this. You, and mm -hmm. I, I think my understanding is you do it piecemeal. You say you focus on local problems and then let them figure out and help them figure it out. Mm -hmm. You don't give the answer. Yeah, that yeah. doesn't work in, well, in that, any realm, really. Yeah. Um, 
it's more I'm doing this because it really it feels like it's kind of mm. feeling out for where um, where you can go you know where does does this seem like the person can emotionally and it is emotional not intellectual will you emotionally go there can they will will they be willing to consider this will they not uh -huh. um, would they how how are they with looking at logical contradictions some people will some people uh -huh. that's just not relevant because everything's emotional anyhow um, yeah, one of our members of the RET and the ASK group is, uh, I've forgotten the woman, Martha Nussbaum is a woman she put me in touch with. Uh, but Nussbaum is pointing out how cognitively, how cognition and thinking is involved in emotion. Mm -hmm. If you are afraid, what are you afraid of? And that's a cognitive stance. You know, you know, you don't just have fear, it's got to be of something. And if it's anxiety, you hadn't nailed it down yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's still trying to figure out what it is and how it's coming. In other words, our yeah, cognition... I'm, I'm doing this because I disagree. Go, good. Um, a lot of times, it's... You see, that's, that's a strict cognitive psychologist's viewpoint that all emotion originates in a thought. I don't think so, and a lot of people don't think so. There's a lot of emotion that is biologically based. Oh, well, I have, and yeah, that, that people, makes some sense. Some people are literally anxious, and it's biologically based, yeah. and it just kind of looks for something to attach to, but that's not really what's going on. It's like people who are depressed uh -huh. And you think, well, what do you, and people, non-psychologists will say, what are you depressed about? And they don't know. Well, um, I got a traffic ticket, and I'm not doing so well in French, and Marion wouldn't go out with me. But that's not really what's going on. What's going on is they are depressed, and they look for explanations of it. Uh -huh. So... Yeah, sometimes it's about the, okay. the content, the thought. Sometimes it's not. Well, I'll have to back off. I don't think emotion is simply a byproduct of thinking. That that would be a mistake. If I stump my toe, it's pain. Yes, <laughs> yes. Okay. That's not and because I, I think, oh, then, I don't like the fact that my toe is curled exactly. around. Exactly. Yes. And if I've been insulted, there's a little cognition there. Yes, yeah. But also, I may have jumped too quickly, uh, you know, and, mm -hmm. and they reacted. If I had did some, did, if I had done some more thinking, <laughs> I would have said, "Well, everybody has a right to his opinion," mm -hmm. and uh, and or, I don't have or, to buy it. Right I'm really pissed off because that guy looks like my dad, and I'm really not happy with my dad at the moment, <laughs> which can be could be the and same. that's and that's Thanks. emotional. Yeah. We got another caller. Go. We got another caller. Hello. Go Hello. ahead. Uh, in your experience, have you ever had patients just with a, what we would, what you might call mystical, magical thinking? Uh, the radio is giving me messages, things like that. Ah, oh, yeah, that's psychosis. Yeah, uh, in an inpatient environment, we used to have people like that pretty frequently. Yeah. And uh, oh. one of the things we had shy away from was religion because oh, even yes. though if the patient wanted to talk to because talk about it because mm -hmm. that fell into the mystical magical part that was part of the problem. Yeah. However, mm -hmm. when I got uh, later on, years later, when I was doing another job in a hospital, there was a clinical facility for inpatients that what that was. Uh, contracted or that the, the floor was actually rented out by a Christian organization that were doing their own clinical work, giving uh -huh. drugs, giving counseling and everything else, but they were a Christian organization mm -hmm. and consequently they would have prayer meetings, uh, They would there was uh, scriptures on the wall regarding healing and the Lord and all this sort of stuff mm -hmm. and I, I was totally taken back by that because I thought it fell into that type of category uh -huh. and apparently this uh, sort of thing is not that 
uh, rare. There are oh, inpatient, yeah. mm -hmm. and when a person is so vulnerable at that stage, it seems like they would get converted, if you will, or at least made more strong in their faith. Do you have an opinion on mm -hmm. combining on whether that's ethical or not? Therapy. Sounds like you're saying, is that ethical to do that? Okay. Is, it's, is uh, it ethical? Yeah, I think that, I think you could have a real debate about it. But it also sounds like you're talking about somewhat different different things. Um, religious delusions are really common in psychosis, uh -huh. but that is not that could be pretty different from what they were doing in the prayer meeting. Mm -hmm, I'm thinking mm -hmm. of things like like AA, where you know you're talking about a higher power, whatever whatever that means mm -hmm, to you, mm -hmm. um, to help you, helping you get stronger, get better, not through anything mystical, not because. But I, I know what you're 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 worrying that if a person is already pretty shaky in terms of reality, if this is going to okay, going to cement the the try, shakiness. But try, I, try this. Yeah. Um, you have to start where people are, okay, and not dump on them your point of view, uh, because mm -hmm. part of where people are is they have their own reinforcement network, mm -hmm. their social group, and they have their own language. Ah, so you're saying this would this would really work for people who are very Christian mm -hmm. and it could be more helpful to them. Yeah. Because it starts with their language, it starts with what they're familiar prayer groups. They're familiar with prayer groups. This this feels yeah. and then they might be more amenable to what they In other words, need to rather do than trying to take somebody See, th there are what I call uh, uh, evangelistic evangelical atheists. My father was one. Yeah, and I and and these people don't understand. The job is to try to help people where they are. Yes. And then let them work to another problem, because it will mean it will mean more to them if they solve the problem rather than you simply give them your own particular verses of atheistic scripture or Buddhistic scripture or whatever. Yeah, yeah which they're not going to buy because it no, isn't, doesn't it mean isn't anything, anything to them. And these groups try to use their language mm -hmm. and have enough sense to see you need a personal group of support mm -hmm. group and then they can work through it mm -hmm. with their language. Yes. For example, and they can still, they may not change their religion, but it may make the whole thing comfortable enough. They can work with the therapist. They can, they'll take medication as opposed to going, no, I can't do medication because that's not religious. Like, and in the process, in the process, they will modify their religion. <laughs> you see, they, they may. it just seems the word came up unethical. It just seems terribly unethical that you're pumping somebody with Thorazine or Elevil and at the same time you have religious ideation all over the place as opposed to what you're saying work it work through it yourself uh, mm -hmm. I have seen fundamentalists be to terribly unfair about how you know your child died because of sin oh, yes. or your child mm -hmm. is going, you know God wanted your child in heaven that sort of thing so mm -hmm. the next time a problem comes up one might again turn to religious ideation if they've been uh, been uh, experienced with that from from an from an environment where people are in lab coats and stethoscopes and and uh, while you have the I guess it depends on the, on the kind of religion they're doing. I mean, if they're doing the the sort of toxic thing you're talking about, that would be unethical. Um, okay. But okay. I, I think it has to. If be. we get back to this group, the, the Scandinavian. Uh, oh, they're, yeah. Yeah, there there is plenty of room within the Lutheran background to deal with this kind of, of what I'd call uh, uh, legalism. Uh, the Lutheran tradition has dealt with this. Uh -huh. Now, it, I have to say I heard Walter A. Meyer, famous radio Lutheran preacher, seemingly did not understand his own religion. 
but the notion of justification by trust or faith, and they don't mean faith, and they meant simply, if there's a deity, don't think you're going to send up reams of sacrifices and self-punishment to influence the deity. Because if he is God, he's already ready to forgive anyhow if you figured out what you've done wrong in the first place. Um, okay. Is this a response? Yeah, go. I, I'm a little confused about the, how you're connecting this with the questioner. Well, what I'm trying to say Me is, too. Okay, what I'm trying to say is you have to start with people's religions where they are. Okay. Rather Actually, in psychology, for the most part, I would imagine that you would uh, try to leave the person's religion alone and talk about, like you said, the reality of the situation. As a matter of fact, one popular, used to be popular, form of therapy was called reality therapy. Mm -hmm. And that is, this is where you are, this is the way things are, and let's see what brought us to this position. And uh, in that therapy, there's really no need for any prayer, scripture, or cartoons of Noah with on his boat on the wall. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no need for... Well, I'm, uh, yeah, uh, it's true because you don't start with it yourself. But the point is, when people are in that frame of reference, mm -hmm. then if you can use their frame of reference to help them, then I see nothing wrong with this, mm -hmm. if their whole goal is to help them. Because if now if you can find another way, in other words, you work use whatever works. Well, I guess you're you're actually creating another question, and mm. that is, what is the difference between a practicing psychologist, clinical psychologist, in what they do? What is the difference between them and a fundamentalist or a some a minister who's going to uh, counsel the person about their problems? much from the same point of view as far as here's the problem, here's the psychology of it. It appears to me the only difference is is not having a degree and not having malpractice insurance. Well, when you're saying a fundamentalist preacher who would basically... I'm talking about a minister who you go to for like, counseling. Like pastoral counselor. Talk. Well, any, any kind of counseling. You know, I am having problems with my wife. I'm having problems mm -hmm. because I'm having these uh, suicidal thoughts or... Okay, or, here's, a, here's a question for you. Okay. Could a person be a, a um, say, a Lutheran minister and be a good counselor in psychology? Both. I have no idea. Okay. Now, I do. I answered your question. <laughs> okay. That's okay. I have an idea and you don't. Uh, you've, had a, you've had a lot of ideas I haven't had. That's no big problem. <laughs> My question is, uh, I think a, and I know some Lutheran ministers and other kinds of ministers who are good counselors, and they know how not to bring in theology and how to do it. Well, let me let me take let me take back just a second, Go. Mr. Rogers, a very a man I respect very much, yes. uh, doing a lot of good educational work and all that with children. Mm -hmm. He was a certified minister, and I find yes. not mistaken, he might have been Lutheran, but he never brought religion into his craft just as I wouldn't expect my plumber, as you've used before uh -huh, as an analogy, uh -huh. to, to tell me about how his Seventh-day Adventism is going to fix my, my hot water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you, which, which Rogers are you talking about? Is he Carl he's, Rogers? I think he's talking about, you're talking about Fred Rogers, aren't you? Oh. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers. Oh, oh, Fred that, okay. Rogers. Okay. Mr. Rogers, who one. was a minister. <laughs> he was. Well, oh, he was, as a matter of fact. Yeah, I yeah. Think. I'm not sure. Well, uh, the only time you bring it in, of course, is when your client brings it in. Yes. But, of course, we're running out of time, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. I'm I, sorry I, wish... I kept you on the phone. No, no, that's okay. Not it's a good all. question. And, and, and uh, if you can, next time, maybe we'll bring you back up. On, on this topic again, because it's too good to, to ignore. Yes. I want to good. thank you for being here this short period of time. Oh, I've enjoyed we'll, it. I'll, I'll hang up and let you play your cartoons and clothes. Okay. Well, I, I think we've run out of time just about. I want to thank our audience for, right. and I want to thank you for being here with us. Oh, Maybe